Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, You Shall Have No Other Gods, the book of Exodus. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 28 of our study, which covers the book of Exodus, chapters 39 and 40. Here at last, we come to the end of our journey through the book of Exodus, though it is not the end of the journey of these people through the wilderness. Um, that's continued especially in the book of Numbers. Um, so if you want to know how it ends, uh, this whole journey, there is further reading to do. Um, note, because I think this is interesting to think about, where Exodus ends, it gets us to the base of the mountain, the covenant made with God, and the people ready to have God travel with them, right? They've got priests, who are, as we'll see, appropriately dressed. We've got our tabernacle. We've got all our stuff. The glory of the Lord can appear in the midst of his people. They're ready to go. But it's you just have gotten to the idea of you have God's people who are ready to travel with God, right? You're actually, like, from a spiritual point of view, you're actually just ready to start the journey, not you've ended it, right? Like, the road out of Egypt is a pathway from being in being slaves of the Egyptians and Pharaoh to being the people of God, right? That's the journey that is completed. Um, and that's the one that matters, right? Like where the people of God are physically present is less important than the journey of being not the people of God to being the people of God which completes, um, although we see that that's also an ongoing journey, um, and it has its challenges along the way. Um, but it's interesting to think, how can this be considered a complete narrative when they're mid-journey? Well, because the story is trying to tell is of a different sort of journey, um, and the culmination of that journey that we see as our book closes, is the glory of the Lord comes upon the constructed tabernacle, right? The, the high point of the book is now God isn't just on the mountain, right? He is now ready to travel with Moses, who's going to travel with these people, so that God is traveling with the people. But you know, by agreement that he's traveling with Moses. Um, that's a huge thing that's accomplished. Like, it, we can take that for granted now, looking back, because we have something so much better that this doesn't look like a huge deal. But this is a huge deal that you have these people that God says, yeah, I'm going to, you're going to go and I'm going to go with you. Uh, and you're my people and we're all, we're all in this together. Um, and if you think about where we started, a bunch of scared people living as slaves in Egypt, uh, that is a, that is an unbelievable thing that was achieved. Uh, not only freeing them from the slavery, but getting them to agree to be God's people, uh, which again we see is maybe a little problematic, but like they're they're in, right? They're whether they really want to be or not, they're kind of they're past the point of no return now, right? These are God's people. The covenant has been made, the law has been carved in stone. The, they're on the pathway, right? We're, we're starting the journey of God's people rather than always before you had God of a guy, right? He was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Sometimes he's even the God of Joseph. Um, he's not the God of Moses. He's the God of these people. We have made that transition and he is with his people in this tabernacle in a way he was never with Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. The, the way God relates to humanity has been irrevocably changed over our course of this book. It's a huge thing that's happened. Um, 
and so much by way of summary, we've talked about sanctifying things, right? Creating the space a lot. Um, that is an essential thing for the change in how God is present with his people, right? It's not like an accidental or a peripheral or a secondary thing. It is, if you want God to be present with you as his people, you have to make a space for him to do that. Um, and that's true before, and that's true now. Um, and so like, the takeaway of the second half of this book is all about how we sanctify things, how we make that space for God so that he can come into it and we can be his people still um, and have a closer and an even more intimate space. And that ultimately when that's done right, the glory and presence of God enters into his people. As we went in order from laws to tabernacle and sanctuary to priesthood, when we were talking about what was going to be done, so are we going in the same order when we're executing those things. Um, and that is the order of importance. Um, we carved the tablets and had them final before we built the stuff before we're getting, the order repeats. Uh, God, here's God what we're going to do, and now here's what we're doing. Um, so here we are creating, uh, we're finally getting to the garments for the priests, um, which we've talked about already, but to be priests, and especially high priests, um, requires dressing for the job. There's not a lot here, but it is worth reiterating that the garments of the high priest, so the priests are of the tribe of Levi and will perpetually be so uh, in terms of the Aaronic priesthood, right? That, like that's a prerequisite for qualification, um, unless you have a trump card like Jesus does, uh, as we've talked about previously. But in general, that is how that works. Um, but, the high priest is not only representing his tribe, right? He's dressed with, he's clothed with, he's putting on the other tribes as well. This is, he's pulled out from the one tribe to stand for and to represent all of them before God. Um, as also all of these people are signaled out as people, as the people of God, but they're meant to likewise facilitate a relationship with all peoples of the earth. Um, it's, God uses this idea where one can stand in and create a pathway for more and for more and for more. And that doesn't stop, right? We all gain access to God the Father through the one, through Jesus Christ who has that access. Um, the idea of needing an intermediary until the end of time doesn't go away. Um, we just get a better intermediary who likewise takes upon himself not just the names of our tribes, but all of our names and our very identities uh, are carried within the body of Christ, right? We are carried into the presence of God, not just by name, but by in a much deeper way in the presence of Christ, who bears us all into the presence of God. This is the second lengthy description of this breast piece that we've seen. Um, so for now, it's worth just saying they make it. Uh, and this is for the high priest and it separates out, uh, it's the office of the priesthood, right? Like. We still, our priests still wear stoles when doing priestly things. Um, the, the office is something to be put on, even more so back then than it is now, right? You're not just serving the function of high priest by being the oldest son of Aaron uh, living. You have to put it on as well. Um, even now with 
ordained priests who, you know, it's who they are at a, a deep core function. They still put on a stole when doing priestly things. Uh, it is still because they cease to just be them at that point, right? Uh, the thing they're really putting on is Christ, but there's still this more than symbolic piece of clothing that is putting on the office when you're going to execute or carry out a function of the office. And that that is a big deal, right? Um, it is because it is a very important office. Uh, and it, it's, it also creates a separation between the office and the man, right? Aaron, not an awesome guy, uh, not a great spiritual leader like his brother. Uh, but that's Aaron the guy, right? Then he wasn't, he wasn't in all the trappings of office when he did those things, right? Uh, but now Aaron the high priest becomes something more than Aaron the guy. And every high priest after wearing the same or a modeled after it outfit as Aaron is put and is putting on the same thing. And the more of them do it, the more it comes to mean, right? It's because it places you in that tradition. Uh, our priests' souls are simple because they're echoes of what Jesus wore, right? So they are putting on Jesus, Christ, when they're doing it. Uh, and it gains its value also from who wore similar garments to do priestly things. Um, it doesn't matter who else did it between Jesus and them because it's all, it's all an imitation of Christ. Um, it's, this is very much a, a case of the clothes make the man, both then and now. They also have robes. Um, and this is now, Aaron gets a fancier one and all of his sons get them as well, right? So you have, you might think about this as like, if a mass is being celebrated, the bishop dresses nicer than other priests who might be in attendance. Um, Aaron is the, the better dressed one, but everybody, all of Aaron's sons as priests also are wearing lesser priestly garments as well. Everybody has clothes of the office of priest, but high priest has special and nicer clothes. Um, but everybody gets their stuff. This part came up before, and the important part was the plate with the inscription, right? On the head marked holy to the Lord. Where do we do that? Uh, the here is called the crown, which it wasn't before. Uh, it's, that's not a thing to get hung up on, right? Like, this isn't marking them as kings. Uh, it is not of royal authority. It, it is authority. It is not royal authority as we tend to think of crowns. Uh, we don't have kings yet. We're not going to for a long time. And it's generally regarded as... A poor idea when we do. Uh, the priests are definitely not kings, even the high priest. He's not even, as we'll see, really the leader of the people. So this is very much a symbolic thing, and what the what it says, the engraving, is the important part of it, right? It doesn't say this guy is in charge. It says holy to the Lord or set apart for the service of God. So the crown sets apart the priest, like everything else that's being worn, uh, but doesn't imply political authority. This is a lengthy way to say they had all the stuff complete and they brought it all to Moses and Moses blessed them. And that's the important part, right? Um, Moses didn't make all of this. Um, God told Moses what needed to be done, but it's important that the people themselves did it. Um, because it's going to be, it's not, 
the God of Moses. It's the God of these people. So these people need to be the ones doing the work. So they bring it to, to Moses as a re representative of God who says, yep, that's good, uh, which, is, which is important as well. But when we are doing this work of creating space for God, it's important that other people don't do it for us, right? It's work you have to do yourself. If you want God to live and to travel with you uh, and you want that relationship with God, it's not a thing like a priest or the Pope or a saint or anybody else can do for you, right? Moses can work out God traveling with Moses and he did. But in order for God to travel with the people, they have things they have to do as well. And that's true of us as well. No one can do that work for us. We have to do it for ourselves. And so these people did as well. So here, they set everything up. And the interesting thing about all of this is when it happens. It happens on the first day of the first month. There are two ways you can look at that and one makes a lot more sense than the other. One could be, oh, what a coincidence that they happened to have all of this done and ready to go right when they were getting to the first day of the first month. That's the version that doesn't make sense, but it's possible knowing God. The more likely thing that reinforces kind of a point in the, re in the introduction here is that for them, this is the beginning, right? Their calendar, they choose to start their calendar when all of this is ready to go, right? Like, okay, new beginning, starting fresh. This is day one, month one. Right now, this is all set and done and ready to go. Um, it's, it, it really highlights what this is for the people, right? And that having all of this done, ready to set up and ready to institute, this is not the end of their journey. This is very much the beginning of a journey uh, and the beginning of their identity as a people. Uh, so when this is all done, it becomes day one. So it's day one, everything's set up. What do you need to do now? Uh, now you get it ready to use, which in this case, with the stuff involves anointing it and consecrating it with oil and with the would-be priests it involves washing them and then going through some of that anointing and uh, priestifying rite that we talked about uh, earlier, uh, the consecration of priests. Uh, so we're going through and you can't have the priest until you have the stuff. Uh, we talked about that before, like the priesthood is not the primary thing, right? They are in service of the stuff, which is in service of the presence of God. Uh, they're the least important part of all of this and not the most important part. Uh, and where they lose their way is when they miss that point uh, and seek to make it not true. Uh, as also happens to us when we ascribe to ourselves in relationship to God, undue importance that is not merited by uh, reality, uh, then we can go astray. But we are consecrating the things, even the instruments of like, worship are consecrated before the priests. Um, they're last, they matter. Uh, you need to have the priests to do it all, but everything in its due order and place. There's an odd thing here. So most of this straightforward, right? God said, Moses, I want you day one, first day of first month of the first year, I want you to set all this up. Uh, and Moses says, okay, boss. And then we skip to the first day of the first month of the second year. Moses sets it all up. Um, Honestly, I'm not sure why that is, right? It could be discrepancies between the text. It could be any number. I, it seems unlikely that it took them a year to do it when it was all ready already. Uh, it could be 
a time shift back to Moses on the mountain being told about all of it versus now it's finally complete and it took them a year to get it done. It could be trying to suggest that. It could just be a weird time discrepancy. Uh, I think the point still stands that they're measuring time from the beginning, from when they're ready to go and worship God. Even if it's year two, it's still day one, month one. Like it's still, the calendar is still defined by being ready to do this. Uh, why we're jumping to year two, I honestly have no idea. It seems odd. Um, but beyond that, this is very straightforward, right? They set everything up and it's ready to go. Because it's right at the end, this is an easy thing to gloss over as being the culmination of many, many chapters of this book, right? Like this is the culmination of everything that's happened since the people got to the foot of the mountain, which is the culmination of everything that happened before that, right? This really is the climax and the culmination of the book is after all of this, the glory of the Lord appears on the tent. Um, how does God appear? How does God's glory appear? Like a cloud. Uh, we talked about that some before, but I'll reiterate the point because I think it's fascinating. Does this mean God looks like a cloud? Because I've definitely heard that view before and I used to hold it sort of because I hadn't thought about it enough. Um, and it's easy to, oh, God just looks like a cloud. Um, no, no, that's not what, it, that's not what this is. And hopefully you've been following along well enough. You already know what this is, but in case somebody missed it, the idea here is you cannot see the face of God and live. So when God is going to be present, the cloud is there to obstruct and to obscure, um, God, um, the cloud is a layer of, it's like the tent itself, right? It's a layer of obfuscation or obscurity, uh, abstraction between people and God. Uh, it's for the people's protection. God can be in their midst, but they can't see him. Uh, even Moses can't go in the tent when the cloud is there. Because we saw previously Moses can see God's back. Moses can't see God's face any more than anybody else. If God is really going to be present, which is what this cloud suggests, you can't see that, um, at least in the Old Testament. So does God look like a cloud? No. The cloud is there so the people don't accidentally look at God uh, because they can't tolerate that. So... It is a necessary layer of separation, even when God is in their midst. Uh, and we already talked previously about that goes away in Christ, um, where you actually do see the face of God. But you still, in the body of Christ, when you look on God the Father, you're still doing it through God the Son's eyes, like kind of literally, um, so that... These eyes can't see God any more than theirs could uh, and live. Jesus's can. So I can look at God through the Father, through the eyes of the Son, and I can live through that. But I, even today, can't look at God the Father uh, directly any more than these people could. We just have a perfect intermediary who, you know, can go into the tent unlike Moses. Um, so the gap is bridged in Christ but we still need the intermediary. So finally, by way of conclusion and setting up what else is to come, uh, here in this last bit of this book is the idea of this has changed the reality and the destiny of these people, right? They met God at this mountain and now they're taking God away from the mountain with them and in their presence. Um, the deal is struck. He is their God. They are his people. He is going where they go, whether they end up liking that all the time or not. Um, and at least as we're starting out, God is going to guide their way in their path. Um, 
at some point that changes. But for now, God is their guide and they're going along with them and God is traveling in their midst. This has been the conclusion of the Turning to God's Word Bible study, You Shall Have No Other Gods, the book of Exodus. For more information, consult our written study and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.